Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name's Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. We are talking about a classic perennial comic, man, the Frank Miller, Dave Mazzucchelli collaboration on Batman Year One. But first, got some business ahead of time. Patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. I just posted Rambo 3.5 on there. I post a lot of my mini comics, my zines that are out of print. And uh, this month's is Rambo 3.5, won an Ignatz Award for this. And for all you Rambo fans at home, if you're concerned about gaps and continuity between Rambo 3 and 4, that's what this is for. But uh, you can find all my art, process posts, notes, uh, notes on cartoonist kayfabe sometimes. So if you're a fan here, check it out, patreon.com slash jimrug. The word is out on the streets, and i got to thank the kayfabers, because as of this recording, there have been over 1,000 pre-orders within the first week, but I'm going for uh, 3,000, Jimmy, because by the time this video goes up, there might be over two. That is awesome. Congratulations, Ed, and, and, and congratulations, cartoonist Kayfabe Nation, for being a, being a big part of this, man, making this happen. Absolutely, man. A bunch of pre-orders on a book where people are chopping each other's heads off. Uh, Jimmy and I have link trees in the description below this video for all of our stuff. Problem is, man, uh, overseas shipping, shipping to other countries costs a lot of money right now, and we just we are looking into it. Not an easy fix. Uh, hit my Patreon up, patreon.com slash edpiscor. You can read the comics online. Check it out. when Free the... shipping. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> straight, to your, straight to your laptop. And uh, you'll be able to make smart buying decision when it comes time for uh, the book collections, which will have wider distribution be, be available in your country. Yada, you know what yada. I love is that there are so many methods to get things today. You know, if the shipping is too much on a one-book basis... It, it'll come through comic shops. It'll come through the direct market. It'll come through digital. Right. It'll come through book collections. So there'll be there'll be some perfect opportunity for uh, everybody out there. And it's up to us to deliver that stuff in the way that uh, the reader wants to get their hands on on the thing, man. Uh, let's talk about another comic that has uh, many formats and many editions uh, over time. And uh, we are on the record on previous videos talking about how the Batman Year One Absolute Edition is pretty much one of the most beautiful packages pause put together ever from um, marvel or dc or any of the big two publishers when it comes to just you know packaging a classic story you get the uh two hardcovers one hardcover um has a very very faithful approximation of the newsprint scans from david mazakelli's uh archive you know his, his own copies of the actual printed comic there you go and then the other one would be the uh, the Hollywood version. When we were kids and we picked up that uh, the the trade paperback edition, the hardcover with the new uh, Richmond Lewis recoloring, that's this version in here, uh, printed bigger than your average comic, so that you know you could bask bask in the artwork a little bit more. Yeah, I love the oversize. Makes it a little bit easier to read. It's a dense comic, so being blown up a little bit, it still looks amazing. And uh, like you say, Ed, you can definitely appreciate the art, you know, maybe on a, on a, almost like looking at it under a magnifying glass. And who doesn't want to do that? You know something, man, like when we busted this out and read it in prep for this episode, it made me realize that uh, issue, the last two issues of this were my, uh, were my first Batman comics. And from that point until uh, Nightfall, whenever they tried to start getting me to buy Catwoman comics to read part 13 of a story, <laughs> uh, I quit. But... I started reading Batman with this, and we always talk about, and you always hear in interviews, uh, you can never trust that, you know, this comic or that comic will be on the on the racks at the Pig, Piggly Wiggly, the 7-Eleven. Batman is always available where, wherever you go. Like, uh, the places that I went, you know, the, the gas station, the grocery store, Batman comics would be there. They're, they're never selling out. So I, month in, month out, I got a long box full of those damn Batman comics that uh, that I picked up, you know, after checking this out. I was not uh, not on board at that point. You know, my first exposure is the recolored version, is the trade paperback. And I, I assume probably most people have read it in that trade paperback format uh, just because it's been a perennial in print ever since then. Yeah. Uh, I have since gone back and bought the single issues uh, because I do love that original coloring. I like the recoloring. This is just an unusual comic and how successful it is creatively you know it's pretty rare and like to be part of their monthly publication schedule i know they did four issues so it's equivalent of a mini series but it's still like for you to be able to just buy this in issues off the rack in, in lots of other people too it's amazing like i think all the time whenever a new comic comes out and it's some prestige format or it's some standalone mini series like 
why? Why wouldn't you run this through that main character's main title? Like, isn't that the way you you, you booster those sales? You get long-term fans. You keep people interested in the comic book series. And, uh, and they do it again and again. But this is one of those amazing examples where it's like, I don't know, four of the best Batman comics ever. And they just happens to run in Batman 404 to 40, you know, 407. Like, few, few great uh, coll wild. collaborations when it comes to... Uh, you know, mainstream comics. They're, you could almost count them on one or two hands, uh, and most of them have Alan Moore, Frank Miller involved in, in, in some way. This is one of the perfect collaborations uh, amongst all party members. Frank Miller, Mazzucchelli, Todd Klein on lettering, yes. Richmond Lewis on, I was say the, on, the, thing. on the colors. So here's what we're going to do, Kayfabe crew. We are debating, like, how do we present this material? Uh, personally, Jimmy and I, we're, we're sort of, you know, we want to look through this uh this four color joint uh it's we've looked through so many of those old comics and it's cool to see what richmond lewis does with that very limited palette but uh we'll check out issue two of the uh the recolored stuff that she did when she had uh more colors at her disposal and, and more technique able to be applied to the pages uh, so i think that that's how the division of our little walkthrough um, if you're ready to go, Jimmy, I'm ready to go. Dive in, man. This could be its own YouTube series, by the way. You know, like it's such a rich work to get into. And it'll be hard not to harp on, on every single detail. But, you know, you mentioned Richmond Lewis, and it's probably worth just coming in right off the bat. This is a person whose background is painting, was an exhibiting painter at the time, continues to have a successful career as a painter. I don't know that she's colored too many other comics. So, like, she's not coming with a comic book colorist eye. She's coming with a painter's eye, but using the palette the comic books are assigned at this time, which is part of what makes this color job so fascinating to, to us uh, because it's just that different perspective. It's a thing that I've seen in every comic book I looked at pre-1990, but this one looks different for some reason, and it's because of her eye. She's seeing that palette differently than your typical comic book colorist. Let's talk about the typical splash page and how, these. and how this is far different than uh, any splash page you've seen before or since, basically. I don't know who to credit for this because it's different in terms of design, color, layout, typography. It's all totally different. I love it. We were talking about it off air, Ed. These, these opening little bits of, of you know segments, I remember reading this for the first time and they just grab you. They do exactly what you want it to do. Uh, brilliant who who gets credit for this whoever it is out there pat yourself on the back i love them let's dive in man the conceit it's batman year one so uh there have been you know this set a template for like year one type stories i don't know that very many other year one type stories like actually catalog the year that's transpiring you know like by actual giving giving us actual dates uh but we're setting a template here, and Frank Miller does so in this comic. And we have our, our two main characters both arriving in Gotham City in two different fashions. We've got young Jim Gordon, lieutenant, coming from Chi-Town, I believe. And he's taking a train. And he's, uh, you know, he's amongst, he's amongst the, uh, you know, regular folk. And he doesn't quite like it that much, man. He's going to fly the wife in next time. And then you see pretty boy Bruce Wayne, who uh, is having the exact kind of opposite experience and he wants to be on the train so that he could be quote unquote closer to the enemy this little young bil billionaire wants to be amongst the poor people and see how those scoundrels live it's a fantastic first page totally isolated the the image of bruce wayne uh you know high contrast to how, how gordon's on a packed train uh you can even see the the woman he's sharing the seat with is breastfeeding next to him people are just packed in their humanity all around him it's a it's a giant difference even the coloring you know bruce bruce wayne nice and cool there set aside set away from everything else but also note that lettering you know the january 4th is mechanically set i often talk i often defend the idea of using mechanical lettering i think this is a great example of mechanical lettering the other thing you see todd klein doing right here on page one i mentioned this is a dense comic because we're seeing not just all these different characters coming together but their points of view like we get inner monologues from these guys gordon and wayne here on the first page todd klein gives them different lettering styles so that visually we instantly know whose voice we are hearing when we read this stuff. Yep, this is the Gordon voice and the uh, cursive is the Bruce Wayne voice. Now let's give Richmond Lewis a little bit of props and just, you know, if this is almost any colorist. All the, you know, Caucasian white people be colored one color. There's what, maybe three, four different colors. Like this color shooting through the window is different than this color that's 
covered by an underpass in some shadow. It's different from this color. It's different from this color. And these background characters. That's incredible. That is really incredible. That's at least five different colors that are being applied for flesh tone on two pages. On the first two pages, it's brilliant. You know, talk about keeping the visual interest, keeping the reader on their toes, making scenes unique to the setting where they're at the time of day. Brilliant. And, and one more piece. No color here. Just let the characters do the talking. You're going to learn a lot about color. I feel like we could just focus on these two pages, <laughs> man. It's incredible. We, we did blow by one piece, and that's the introduction of Flash. So this right, is a character yeah. we don't know from Batman, but is really important in Batman Year One. He's the corrupt detective that uh, kind of takes Jim Gordon in as soon as he gets off the train and is like, welcome to Gotham. Let me show you what the cops are like here. And you, and you get the impression that he's a schmuck bad guy from page one. Cops got it made here in Gotham. Like Big dude, too, man. Yes. Towering over Gordon. Physically yes. intimidating. The script, I imagine, had to go through a couple of rewrites, uh, and this this panel here signifies some of that to me. Uh, we see uh, the commissioner, uh, Jillian Loeb. I thought Jillian was a... Might be Gillian. Ah, okay. Although I don't know that for sure. But Gill <laughs> would be your short, you know, like your, your nickname, and, and that comes up later. Yeah. His look, superiors refer to him as, by his nickname. Look at all these pop, pop culture tchotchkes all around his office. That's com going to come into play a little bit later. And once again, let's apply another flesh tone to this dude who has some kind of, uh, you know, some sort of issue with uh, the, the epidermis. That will also come into play. At one point in the future, we're going to see just a close-up of his hand. We'll know who he is because we've seen that blotchy skin throughout the book. And uh, it's almost like you're designing a superhero character, right? Make him stand out in their costume. Make him stand out in these small details. Same, same deal, man. He looks different than everybody else, and it doesn't matter if it's just a close-up of a hand or if it's the whole character. Checking out the spread again, look at the application of the, the negative space where Richmond Lewis felt no need to, to, to add color to let her characters pop. And just as a spread, it really works beautifully. Fantastic. Yeah, it's almost an open panel there. She does a lot of parallels, too, because you see a similar treatment whenever you look at Wayne Manor. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. And we see Flass committed, performing a little police brutality on the local denizens of Gotham City. By the way, is he drinking and driving? <laughs> panel one of that page. Little, little pony bottles, too, huh? Oh, yeah, we, he's got the suds on the jib. We are really showing off what a scumbag Flass is, <laughs> just from, from first intro on. Now, this is post-Dave Morell uh, first blood, man, so you got to tell everybody that he had uh, Green Beret training. We know what that means after seeing enough John Rambo movies. <laughs> That's really good to bring it back to Rambo. Uh, Commissioner Loeb, if you look at his face, I see like a Jose Munoz from uh, Sinner around this time, and it's... it's uh, Interesting because I think that's a guy that goes on to influence Miller. Yeah. You know, his art, known for very stark blacks and whites, big, big splotchy blacks. A um, lot of cool influences, I think, visible in Mazzucchelli's art, which to me, this is a, a pinnacle of superhero art. And I think you see it in today's comics where, I mean, there have been generations now that are just disciples, if you will, of David Mazzucchelli's style. Now, the conceit of the comic, it's Batman Year One, so you're, you're having an imperfect superhero, and he's in training mode, still still a youngster, and I think that, uh, you know, Frank Miller does some good things with the character, even on that page one, he's the protagonist, but he's a weird mother effer, you know, like, all with all of his brooding and all of the inner monologue, you don't, you don't want to aspire to be this guy. I'm glad you say that, Ed. I made those same notes. Because I don't like Batman as a character for these kinds of reasons. Miller touches on a lot of them. He does. You know, he's coming back to Gotham. He's 25 years old. He's been on the road for 13 years basically training to be a fighter. You know, learning fighting, learning detective skills. All the stuff that makes him Batman, it's implied that's where he's been. Uh, I like that part because it does accentuate, like, this is a weird dude. This is a guy who went through trauma, did not recover properly, and now here's the result of it. It's not necessarily a glorified superhero of, like, let's all aspire to be this guy. It's much more of, this guy has some troubling past, and it and it plays out. It's not resolved. Even on this page, certainly very soon after, uh, Bruce Wayne is... Travis Bickle with better accommodations. Great comparison. Perfect. It's, it's, it's better than Rambo. <laughs> <laughs> Here he is, man, putting his, his buck 50 scar on his, on his jib because he's going he's gonna to go out amongst the plebs, man. And in, uh, in 
DC Comics, Clark Kent only has to, uh, Superman only has to put on some glasses, you don't recognize him, and the rich pretty boy who's on the TV every day with Playboy Playmate models, all he has to do is put a scar on his face, you don't know who the hell he is. <laughs> and some shitty clothes. <laughs> Here's our first exposure to Jim Gordon, badass, and uh, maybe the first recall about the uh, Flash being a Green Beret. Just a couple pages from the from the jump. You know, we're on page eight and nine, and we're already getting into it, man. Uh, Flash is established as as uh, you know, like uh, not to not to be trusted. Gordon is like the pious, uh, wide eyed do gooder, and got some dudes showing up. They're making a lot of noise, but he knows that story, man. He knows how that game is played. There's going to be a dude coming right behind him, and he gets to drop on him, but not before. Uh, you know, hearing Flass's chuckle. It's great. The silhouette stuff is so strong. It reads fast. This is a four-issue story, and you, you think about, like, the model that becomes decompressed storytelling. Ed, you mentioned Batman's, you know, whatever, Batfall, Bat, whatever that Nightfall, story. Nightfall, yeah. There's, like, 26 parts to that. Yeah. You know, like, think about how much action happens in four issues here. Like, this is this is moving, man. This is an action movie that we're watching, and this page is a really good example of that. Like, so much has happened, and we're on page nine. Super, super glad you brought that up because one of the major notes that I made while uh, rereading this was just uh, very, very tight editing, precise editing, uh, a perfect amount, of, like not one wasted panel. Uh, you need no more panels. You can't take any panels away. It's extremely tight. Yeah, I wonder about all of that. Like, like, is this con how, how does Miller edit? You know, that's an editing thing, right? Like, what, what do you actually need to show to communicate this? Amazing skill. I don't hear people talk about it very often. Glad you mention it. I don't know how you develop that as a storyteller, if that's a little bit intuitive. And one more. Like, let's just yeah. look at that Richmond Lewis color. Yeah, and a little bit of a formal trick for Mazza Kelly. Like, suddenly he's knocked out of the panel, you know? Get rid of the panel box. Pretty cool, man. Black to white, contrast. And here we are, man. Travis Bickle under 40 deuce. You could even, there goes Sport. And we're going to see Jody Foster right here. Look uh, at the great coloring for Richmond Lewis lighting up this this uh, this dirty street. But yet there's all that fluorescent light. It's a red light district with her just flooding it with the 100% magenta. When we come to money shots like this, why not uh, show, show off both applications? It's how, how about you go through this one so that we can keep page to page? That sounds great to me. I love all of this, though. This strong magenta is something I would always associate with this color job, like really taking advantage of what you could push in terms of your color palette. And those 100% colors are the thing that can really pop, and she does it whenever she gets a chance. Amazing body language in these figure illustrations. You got you got this sort of uh, uh, awkward pimp guy going for him. And look at that. I mean, that's a yeah. Chester Chester Gold villain it really is. face right there, man. But And then you see the, the grace of uh, Travis Bickle here, just dodging that like nothing. This line work and this whole panel reminds me of manga. Even even Akira, I would go so far as to say, like the little bit of shading on her nose and cheek and stuff, That's a, that's a those lines, I think, phase out of Mazzucchelli's work as this story goes on, but that panel really feels manga-esque to me. Do you think that this like this little girl is like uh, Bizarro wor World Carrie Kelly? Like in Batman Year One, this is going to be... You know, the, the, the cool breakout I don't star. know. That's another one of those, like, what's going on in Miller's head? Like, does he have checklists? Does he have things that he's sort of, you know, thinking about as he puts together a, a very large cast for this story? Um, I don't know. It's it's fun. It's part of the, the mystery, part of the magic for me of reading this stuff where I can't tell you where these things are coming from, but they play well, you know? And that's going to go on to be Catwoman's, you know, like like Ward yeah, or whatever. Yeah, so. that's, that's Selena Kyle Catwoman right there. But, I mean, this whole page, this is... This is freaking Taxi Driver. This, oh, is, yeah. this is all totally, the bits, man. Completely. This is also the ground, well, not the ground zero, but this is, if you look into like the black and white explosion comics, they're all set in the cesspool cities. Right, the, yeah. the, the urban, you know, blight of the urban uh, environment of the time. Miller, man, just made his, his name on this. And I guess this is living in New York in the late 70s, early 80s, right? If you get a gun put in your face three times, you're going to want to kill criminals too. Like He said that like <laughs> more than once in interviews. Look at this amazing body language. You just don't get body language illustration like this in your average comic. John Romita Jr. could pull that off a lot. Uh, but these are just like so well posed. I have to imagine that, you know, he, he was setting up a friend or, or 
you know, walking past the karate dojo on the way to his studio and, and sketching some gestures or something. It's amazing. The weight, weight, the balance, all of it's really strong. And it reminds me of, you know, like Miller would choreograph fights in Daredevil. And that was pretty unusual. If you look at like a Kirby fight scene, it's just these big dynamic kind of clashes. Miller took that to the next level and starts choreographing it like Kung Fu movies, for example. Right. This is the next, this is like the nth degree. Like give this to a guy who is the best figure drawer in comics and let him, you know, just sing. It's a great evolution of the fight scene. Take take the color out of this panel, and, and it's that's Jaime Hernandez drapery. You know, like maybe it's a good time to even start talking about that that dumb line theory that uh, Maz Mazzucchelli sort of coined, because I think even Hernandez has has a little bit of that. And and how would you describe it? It's like static line that doesn't like the line isn't used to convey the emotion of the of the scene or something yeah and and i think for superhero comics a lot of times that line is designed to be sexy right and glamorous you know we think of like we, we worship these inkers you know that they're you're joe sinnett's yes exactly uh he was defying that you know this is much more these are people as opposed to that idealized superhero that's perfectly delineated with these flashy feathered lines um it's it's interesting i mean like i said generations of us have kind of followed his example here and there are probably some examples that precede him but this is the one that just was reprinted you could find everywhere and really left a mark and it's great it, it kind of puts i think more emphasis on the color you know so you get a good colorist and then you show it off man car accidents we'll see a couple of those in this comic not an easy thing to draw looks great you know the 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 background color kind of darkens up the image but once again you take the color out of this it's another Jaime Hernandez panel you know just a, it's a cartoon foot kicking a car door yeah great silhouette too great like like think Alex Toth everybody we love showing him off I love the flame color the way that yellow it's almost painted yeah oh, totally yeah absolutely it's a night sequence people and Richmond Lewis ain't gonna let you forget that with the colors that she chose here yeah, look at those blues. So nice. The purples just looks amazing. Yeah, this is dope, man. And, and you know, it's that parallel between Gordon and uh, Bruce Wayne right here, where w Wayne is this brooding kind of guy who's kind of been stewing for a million years. But Gordon just got wronged about, you know, earlier that day or something. You know, he's still got the blood on the jib and he knows who did it. So he goes to the ad house to it. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect, man. This is a scene from Boogie Nights. Whenever totally. the donut shop is being robbed and one set of characters is driving by and the other one's pulling in and we follow, we switch points of view. But Miller does this several times where thematically he's making scene cuts. We, we looked at like, you know, Alan Moore's book on writing and he talks about that, you know. Scott McCloud talks about it. How do you connect these different scenes and one is thematically? Miller does it several times. Yes. There's a great sequence later that I'm going to mention now in case I forget. And it's whenever Gordon comes clean to his wife after visiting Bruce Wayne and they're talking about secrets. It's just the details. This is that editing thing too, you know? Like, what are what do I need to show? And then how do we cut to the next piece and make it make sense? Right. Man, that stuff's tight and sharp. Now, we got, we got All right. Gordon stocking... Uh, Detective Flass, they were playing cards or something after they beat up on Gordon, drinking beers and whatnot. Flass, once again, he was drinking and driving previously. He's going to do a little drinking and driving again. This time, Gordon's going to run him off the side of the road, and we're going to have a duel, a duel in the uh, in the in the in the forest. Payback, yes, sir. Payback and super tough guy stuff. This is one of the inconsistencies that I find in this comic. It's so tough, right? It's been 15 years since I've had to take out a Green Beret. I still give him a baseball bat to make it, uh, give him a chance. The toughest of the tough, you know, like imagine this. Later on, we're going to see Gordon ineffective against one guy who's holding a baby in one of his arms. Right. So it's it's a little bit of a, uh, this is about an 11 on your tough guy scale. It doesn't always hold up that way. And this is the emasculation of Flass. Like you will yeah. not see him. He's now flass id Yes, well done. <laughs> Another car accident, by the way, wrapped around the tree there. I love that tree scene, and that totally calls to mind the uh, DC War story by Alex Toth, where they're running through the, the jungle, and it's all in silhouette. Figures against trees, all silhouetted. Amazing. Always so cool to see what, what he pulls out of the silhouettes to show us. I don't know that you have afterlife with Archie, if not for this panel. <laughs> I mean, literally, you know, like yeah. that's, that's your blueprint for how that artwork looks. For sure. And that's, that's not a complaint, by the way. I think that book looks amazing, but 
clearly it's coming from here. More car accidents? More car, yeah, and that's Bruce Wayne. He's all jacked up. And, Love and the blood trail, too. Straight to the chair, just sitting there, staring at a bust of his dad. Like, Jimmy, you hit the comic book lottery, you get the giant mansion or whatever, man. You're going to get a bust of yourself, man? To, to <laughs> Damn put, right. To put in your media room? <laughs> you, and your, you and your wife could sit there on, on, on your chaise lounge and uh, admire your jib? That's what I'm aspiring to, Ed. <laughs> hit, those Patreons. To -do list. hit those Patreons in, in the description <laughs> <Yes>. below. <laughs> I love the blood splatter, though, and it reminds me of the dumb line. We've seen lots of blood trails in comics. This is just dots of ink. Like, there's no cool effect. This is not outlaw comic blood where we get to see all the splattering and the big drops. This is just a little bit of a subtle blood trail. It's a dumb line version of a blood trail. Now, do you get stray bullets if you don't uh, have panels like this, man? There are a couple of these pages that have like an eight panel grid where it's totally, in my mind, same deal. I don't know if you do or not, Ed, because I, uh, I have a feeling David Lapham's a fan of uh, Mazzucchelli, right? When you have the black border like this and then you have the characters bleeding up there, in terms of composition, you you run into you run some risk mm -hmm. of uh, c creating tangents and stuff. And, and uh, Mazzucchelli does makes good on not on being aware of such things. For instance, if that if this curve right here was just a little lower, now you have conjoined twins. Yes, yeah, and you know it is shadowy. Like it's a really well done trick here. But you're right about the those. Uh, a lot of comics in the early 90s, like the Black Gutters was a popular thing, McFarlane Spawn, for example, but a lot of them. And people who weren't this adept at, like, make sure, you know, th these things are clear, uh, you'll see a lot of problems with the black borders. It definitely can be a, a legibility issue if you're not careful. <laughs> Lest we forget, it's still a superhero kitty comic, man. I shall become come a bat. How badass is the yellow choice? You know, I mean, that's a pretty dramatic shift from we've just had a blue-purple flashback to he suddenly has this moment of revelation and awareness and the color palette drives that home. I pointed out the 100% magenta, let's do 100% yellow. Once again, like what do we have access to? We've got three co colors that we can do super concentrated versions of. Yeah, super fair, man. And you know what, let's, uh, let's tag team. Switch it out. Boom. Keep, keep the flow going. Now we'll look at uh, Richmond's more, more painterly work that was you know, wait, don't turn. Before you make this transition, oh, it's yeah, worth nice. showing off the difference in the splash pages and how those are handled, because again, I like that lead in. You yeah. know, that's a very dramatic thing, these little sentences, which I do assume Miller crafts. Uh, they're, they're dramatic, they set a tone, and uh, once again, what, what are your colors here? 100% magenta and black. I don't even remember what the old video was uh, where Tom sort of commented on how, like, the earliest collections they would kind of do everything they could to get you to forget that it was a monthly periodical, uh, you know, in its earlier life form. They would burnish off the uh, credits boxes, and sometimes it would be so garish. It would be a blank caption box where it would say, written by Alan Moore and drawn by Steve yes. Bissett and John Total. But it would just be a big yellow square <laughs> yeah. in the middle of an illustration, and that's kind of what we're getting here, you know, like, like this is this is the book. April four, we're we're three. We we book one covers three months. Yeah, you know, so you're keeping each, track of your years. Each each issue's a season. Yeah, and uh, Jim Gordon is on the come up in Gotham City. He's getting some big headlines. He's a popular feller, and he's gonna he's gonna save the day. He's gonna be the hero on the scene here. Once one more time, Jimmy. Probably another one to compare. Both this awesome half splash, but also look at the dramatic difference. You know, even here, it's it's. It's a, it's a more muted approach. Uh, it's interesting because the newsprint mutes the color a little bit in the original version, so maybe that's something Richmond Lewis recognizes as we go to this coated white paper. These colors are going to be a little bit super bright. You know, we've seen lots of reprints of archival material where it's on glossy paper and suddenly, like, 100% cyan you can see from the moon. Right. So, you know, some of it may be that, like trying to keep the, the integrity of the, the original color scheme intact. Look at how she conveys the rust bucket car, man. Oh, yeah. It's a good weathered car. The body language of this panel has, like, fucking blew my mind when I first saw this comic. You know, the just the subtlety of the drapery going out like that. Mm -hmm. Like, this, you can't take that stuff for granted. Like, it may, that's why it makes me think that he at least looked at somebody go through that motion so that he could capture a quick gesture. It's all really good. Like, even if 
I don't want to say a throwaway panel, but this is not what I think of as a dramatic panel, but it looks beautiful. Like the, the squiggles for the reflection on the ground are really strong. And then the dynamic that's set up from this low shot and this high shot. Who's in power? The guy with the hostage right now. Not the guy putting his gun on the ground. The writing on this guy, too, is perfect. It reminds me of like that, that behind the bash uh, WCW thing when Hawk and Animal start snorting that coke <laughs> and quit making any kind of sense. And you have a very big, scary guys who aren't making sense and dancing around. That's this guy right here, man. Yeah, no doubt about it. He draws Barbara Gordon incredible. This isn't the best version of her that we're going to see in this book, but it's incredible, and I think it's where the dumb line really takes form is when he draws her because he's not over-rendering her. And again, we'll see it a little bit more later on, but I think she, he learns a lot from drawing Barbara Gordon, and she looks great throughout this this miniseries. Yeah, well said. Uh, in, in superhero comics, uh, one of the big shortcomings is drawing the regular folk and... Uh, Almost zero of your average kind of monthly cartoonist can can pull that off. You you got fifth, you got five year olds with large biceps. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Aunt, yes. Aunt, Aunt May looks like a supermodel. Yeah, it's a good point. There's a lot of body types on display in this comic. One more time in uh, Commissioner Gills. This is office. the weirdest part: is his pop culture obsession. It's so strange. Like, I don't know what it's what what this would be. It, it's a weird character choice to me. I, I, I'm glad he did it. It makes the book more interesting. We're going to see it a few more times. But it's just an unusual choice. Was Paul Levitt's publisher at this time? That's what I wonder if it's a reference to somebody. Because I'm sure DC editors or Marvel editors would have all kinds of pop culture stuff around their office. So it could be a reference to somebody. Different scene, different colors. You know what? Really different. Look at the difference between those two panels in terms of palette. Wow, that's a that's a that's a choice. But I guess you go from purple to your yellows and oranges. You know, you're 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 flipping your color wheel and going opposite to try to make clear that this is a different scene. These are the ones too that are fun to compare. Let's bust it. Pretty close that one. Um, Just I seeing this brush strokes is awesome. Yeah, I, I was gonna say I actually prefer the painted updated version on this it reminds me of an animation background you know the, the the sponge paintings you know those dry brush paintings looks really good same concept obviously but this is what you get when you get full color and there's some of the the better drawing i think that you see on barbara uh you know if you look at like the lines that delineate her limbs her face all of those pieces it's just kind of a flat line mm -hmm. very simple you know there's no extra rendering or texture there it's just flat and i think that you know at this point, issue two, Mazzucchelli's in shape. Like, he knows what he's doing stylistically. You know, there's extra material in this archive edition where you can see him working this out in the sketches and in the early pages. At this point, man, he's just on. The the, the craft of the, just the academic drawing, it's it's 100%. It's all there. But when you, you see this Batman, it, it feels... It's a the Golden Age spirit. And the line work of those old comics was not dissimilar in the amount of, we'll say, lines on the page or lines to make right. a character. It's just he's putting them in a better sequence to make better yeah. drawings. They're and, playing the same notes. <laughs> right. One of them is a, uh, <laughs> a little bit of a, of a master there. Yeah, he's well great with weight. All these characters feel like they have volume. Yeah, yeah. And just, I mean... Balance. He's... He ain't holding a bag of groceries here. Right. And this is an awesome sequence. This might be one of the dopest sequences of the whole thing. This is very iconic. I, when I think Batman Year One, like, this is a big chunk of what I think of. Holding the dude. He doesn't kill anybody. Yada, yada. So he's holding on to a guy while he's getting smashed by stereos, television set, trying to dispatch another dude. Pulls the kid up and over and, you know, handles business. But he got lucky. Lucky amateur. Yeah. There's a, there's a, running through this is the subplot of the television falling. And if he drops this kid and the television still hasn't hit the ground yet, it's fun, man. You know, like Miller's keeping pace with him. It, it really is a team that's on the same page, just running. You know, this is, this is an awesome team at the top of their game. Man, you go through this and it's just, you, you think of, you think of Eduardo Rizzo. I mm -hmm. think of Paul Grist, like so many Names yeah, come I to mind, it Paul Grist. And, and it's makes all... me want to look at Paul Grist comics. Oh, we'll have point. to. We'll have to. I got some canes right there, ready to go. But here goes the next time we see Flass, shell of a man. Yeah, and why is that? He had a run in with the Batman. <laughs> yeah, this is cool. This is that great unreliable narrator stuff where it's still in Jim Gordon's voice, uh, relaying to us the reader 
what Flass is saying, but then we're seeing like the true picture of what was going down in the scene that Flass is describing. And you see, it it didn't happen exactly the way Flass is uh, tell, telling the rest of his comrades. And by the way, talk about Flass having a, uh, a bad year. Yeah, right. First Gordon shows up and kicks his ass, and then Batman shows up and kicks his ass, and it's like, we're, we're just a May. <laughs> and he's, he's real, like, it's a real big fish kind of scenario, man. Like, you know, it's an 11-foot-tall uh, creature. This, this is a better coloring. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. And I get it. You know, that's supposed to be a flashback or whatever, but this is so effective, oh, man. Totally. Just two colors with that pale yellow and red. <sighs> Graphic. You know, even even the Batman jumping in, you know, you can see, like, what an incredible, incredible job the colorist does, in, in my opinion, in that newsprint version. But, man, there's so much good stuff. You know what also struck me on the reread? We don't see a ton of Batman. No. Less is more, you know? It, better to have Flash tell the story than to see it happen. This, to, this is, like... This is Spain Rodriguez, trash man. This is the mm -hmm. the the plutocrats eating long pig. Yeah, the, yeah. This is Miller raging against the machine. <laughs> yeah, it's cool too. As uh, Gordon goes through and he's trying to figure out Batman, you know, he's running down both ends. The corrupt, the corrupt cops on one side of Gordon is is a problem for him. Batman on the other side is a problem for him. But he notes, you know, this Batman is going from uh, interrupting somebody stealing a television set in, in, in some uh, underprivileged neighborhood to working his way up through the, to the pushers, the suppliers, and now the politicians. Yeah, it's good. It is, it is great. And whenever, th I mean, that was the iconic one for me the first time reading this. It was like, that's the greatest image of Batman I've ever seen in my life. And you know, the drawing's nothing special. What makes it great is the context of what he's doing, where he's at. It's just, it's just synergy. You know, it's the writer artist team just killing it. Just looking at the application of tools, man, there's there's weird brushes being used. Like I think probably like even some Japanese calligraphy brush brushes are really good texture being on the used smoke. in this stuff. Also the debris that's coming in from that explosion is just junk. Like you look at that and it really it works great, but man, you could ink that out in, in four seconds. That's yeah. one big dip into the ink well and then just go nuts. Uh, I love the Batman underlit. Made me think like would Batman look better with a mustache? <laughs> it's so funny you say that, dude, because in the Marvel Universe Series 2 cards, there's an uplit uh, card of Loki looking down on the city, and I thought it was, it was the first time I ever saw Loki, <laughs> and so like every time I see the Loki character, it doesn't look right to me w without a Tom Selleck black, beefy Burt Reynolds mustache. <laughs> All right, man, let's do a little bit more Jaime Hernandez right here, right? That's, uh, the, it's a, it's a Jaime Hernandez kind of set of circumstances like in terms of body language and all that but it's a harvey kurtzman rhythm that three panel and i love anytime anytime as kelly's drawing any of the urban environment whether it's rooftops with the water towers or street level alleys and bricks and things it's all uh, incredible and and uh, what batman's doing right there he's kind of he smells a rat. Like yes. he knows that there's a trap, and these guys—they're all cops playing, playing make believe. And that's what Miller's making sure you you understand why Batman's not helping this woman in need. I love how Batman, like his instinct. Everybody's instinct is to like make the guy's butt a naked. A couple of dudes tied up <laughs> naked. <laughs> what is Miller into at this time? <laughs> I have to point this panel out there on Which the one? second tier, the building, just because I love the green and yellow skies. Yeah. That's a real unusual choice, I think. For You know, we say, don't make your skies blue. How about green and yellow? Yeah, that's, that's awesome. That's pretty cool looking. Pretty good color for, uh, we're going to go talk to Harvey Dent, future Two-Face. You know? <laughs> right, yeah. And then you look at this and it's like Parker, you know, Darwin Cook yes. comes to mind. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you wonder that, I mean, this had to have an impact on Bruce Timm and Batman the Animated Series. I would say, yeah, for sure. Love the little Batman there hiding behind the desk. That's, that's, a, that's a good desk, too, man. It's like a nice, thick oak desk. Got Jim Gordon slightly. The, the kind of, like, tryst feels believable. You know, it, it's, it's got this, like, really good arc to it where it's a slow burn to start, and then it kind of... It's very tastefully done. Sure, yeah. We don't we don't see any uh, any any kind of money shot exploitation stuff of like, oh, let's make the detective look really sexy here. And you know what? It, and, and he he also talks about just like her big arms and you know stuff like that. She's too big to be a model and crap like that. But also, it's uh, 
it's a way to make Jim Gordon human. He's not this like binary, you know, does good all the time guy. You know, he's got his flaws. And Miller does a restrained thing too with her. She could easily have been part of the corrupt cops, and she yeah. isn't. You know, she could have been a femme fatale, and she isn't. She's she's his his one ally in this whole thing, and of course he falls for her. He's gonna save that for Sin City when he makes all 100% of the royalties. <laughs> Hey, man, by the way, what we cut into on that same page, and again, talk about heavy lifting, is let's get into some car action. What we always say is notoriously hard to draw, except not for David Mazzucchelli, apparently. Right. But, you know, like all of that on one page. There's another Toth kind mm -hmm. of panel. You think of the Fox or something. I love there. this sequence. And this is what I see when I say, does stray bullets exist? You know, I mean, that's your eight panel grid, these, these top four. It's the exact same layout and phenomenal. Yeah. We pull the the bum lady from uh, Dark Knight Returns. This is her in her younger form, <laughs> right there. When a lot, you did your silhouette zine, and sometimes those silhouettes are the barest human figure, almost stick figures. This feels like he's tracing like a photograph. I'm not saying he is. I'm just saying yeah. he drew a person and then just decided to ink it in black. I love these kind of silhouettes. Like you could very easily throw your tracing paper on there yeah. and, and draw every detail in that guy's anatomy, the, the coat, the everything he's wearing, perfect. I love this panel because it feels like Batman's running like a Keystone cop. Yeah, it's not great. Got the puffed out chest and stuff. He gets tagged a lot, man. Batman has caught some bullets in, in one year. Yeah, it's a, it's a hard year for him, but boy, it's a fun sequence. This is the equivalent to me of the, uh, of the fight scenes that we point out where it's like the choreography is perfect. Same deal here, man. It just flows right through that window as he's as he's fleeing the police. It, it it's that's that great Eisner storytelling where you introduce like the set pieces that then pay off like immediately after. More great silhouettes, and this time combined with a character. Yeah, you don't see that approach much at all. The interiors of this building. Th this is one of the great set pieces, action pieces. What I remember from reading this initially is is what we're coming up to. But Batman in this building. <sighs> One more example of Mazzucchelli draws everything really well. And this right here, man, like the comic comes out in 87. Uh, we looked uh, before at the Trevor Von Eden um, Batman issue 403 or something like a couple months prior. And there was there were ads for the forthcoming year one. A um, couple years before this all took place, there was that situation in uh, Philadelphia with the MOVE organization, the, 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 the Africa with a K family, where... The Philadelphia police uh, ordered a helicopter to drop a satchel of explosives on the roof, and they burnt down, I think, like three city blocks, killed right. everybody in the building, killed a bunch of little kids and stuff like that. That's, And, and basically, the news footage that you see is like this. Mm. It, it looks like that. You know, you see the package get deployed, dropped, and uh, destruction. All right, we're about to switch issues, but I feel like it's worth showing off like some of the color choices because it's very similar, but you see like just just kind of small subtle differences. I do like the Jim Gordon with the red, you know, presumably police light, siren lights kind of things flashing on him. Yeah. But like the white highlight to me really speaks of like heat. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Like your 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 eyes, your pupils pinhole when you see that. This is this is real cool because you could see like the kind of blue line. Mm -hmm. approach where the black is just on a transparency over top of the probably thick artboard with the with the amount of paint you see here you can't do that on paper i don't think yeah and i'll note the windows all blowing out in that building because it's at the bottom of the page so you might overlook that part it's a great detail man it really it kind of shows the explosiveness but you could see the brush strokes like moving into the panels above and it has like such a like a Jackson Pollock kind of quality to it. Yeah, the way that explosion cuts into the black in the back of the pages at the top. Yeah, that's a pretty good use of like those black, you know, black gutters. But then also having that image interact with those black gutters. Let's 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 tap out, Jimmy. Let's switch it up. <laughs> Is it one of the last issues that's going to have a letter from our guy? Yeah, very last one. All right. So, dude, four oh six, April eighty. 87 i was five years old man when i scooped this off the rack and it was just a thing of like it's 75 cents cheap toy you know my dad got it for me would you in a million years think to add green 
to your purple and yellow as these guys go with their flashlights into the shadows. Hit that with some green in between the two. Jimmy, this is the most instructive like application of color that, that I think I have. I mean, this is the essential Batman year one, or absolute Batman year one is a textbook in making a really, you know, sound comic. Another good splash. <laughs> yeah, they've got him cornered. They've got him outnumbered. They've got him trapped. They're in trouble. Yeah, that's that butch. Th that is Miller, Miller at, the, at the peak <laughs> of his, uh, yeah, of his tough guy macho lyricism. All right, man. Well, you know when when he when he draws the actual superhero, like you can't help but think of Toth. Yeah, definitely. And you can see like the uh, death flies the sky. The is, is that the Batman Toth story? Yeah, we'll have to do that story. Yeah, for sure. You can think of it there. But I see that half splash, and it's almost like um, superhero fight stuff. Very dynamic figure. In this case, it's the building being blown up, so the figure's being thrown. But you see it behind him too. There's a figure on fire. I think that's well said. Different, uh, different scene, different colors. I love this. This little strip of the magenta, the twilight. Or, or I guess the, the dawn, the dawning sells sky. Sells it completely. That Beautiful. one little strip of color sells it completely. And uh, this is where we discover that Selena Kyle, her, her superhero origin, she has toxoplasmosis. She's a, she's a crazy cat lady. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there she is right there, man. Imagine the smell of that apartment. Cool interior of this building. Like, you know, what the heck do you look at? Uh, image imagery from the Blitzkrieg or something to try to figure out how to draw this kind of thing. It's good stuff. And he uses that debris as directional devices. You know, you see like the the, the blackboard there pointing towards the center of the panel. But he's also establishing stuff. This yeah. chimney is something that's going to be important spatially. Yep, chimney, the uh, little hatch, all of it. You know, they just automatically assume that he went down there. And we got a damn Vulcan neck pinch <laughs> from the chimney. That's so good. Yeah. We got this very scary place where the superintendent lives. Like, shit, I thought a superintendent was supposed to have a nice place to stay if they're going to listen to everybody's bitching and complaining. But this looks like a damn jail cell. Yeah, that's that's rough. Keep in mind, this building's been firebombed, so it might be a little bit better. Uh, th at least the top part of the building. <laughs> All that Jesus stuff makes me a little nervous. His uh, his setup does look like, yeah, jail cell's the right word for it. The toilet right at the foot of the bed. Yeah. <laughs> and then just drops down that little smoke smoke bomb or whatever. Yeah, it's so smart. And you wonder, like, you know, Miller figures out this thing out in his head of, like, okay, there's a chimney there. Batman could get out. He could trap those guys in there. He could throw a smoke bomb back down the chimney behind him. It's it's great choreography. It is. When I see the little girl, like that's the most kind of Paul Grist. It's stuff. very Paul Grist. Even the hair is Paul Grist like on her. Yeah. How about that for a this great image shot? is incredible. <laughs> yeah, it is. He is not faking. He knows how to draw a helicopter. He's telling you. Yeah, it's a beautiful, very cinematic. All the cop cars on the street too. That second level in that illustration yep. works really well. Yep. I'd have been so satisfied with myself if I just had it minus the helicopter. Cool rotors, like that, that's that's the thing. Like you know, how do you convey that spin? And by him choosing not to and just to have those like little squiggles where we could actually see the thing, it really feels like a snapshot or something. Yeah. Can we get the artist edition, please? I'm looking at this. I'm like, I want to see it in black and white today. It's a pretty big dramatic difference. You look at that top panel, you know, none of the greens. Again, as the sun is coming up, which you can see on the horizon. You know, I look at these colors and I'm like, what month is it? You know, are we getting into the fall? It's a good, or some, it's summer a good months? point. Like, because I think it's summertime, right? Yeah, so that's like dead grass. Somewhere. Yeah, this is June 7th. So I feel like Wayne Manor's... Got a landscaper <laughs> on the payroll, right? <laughs> the The whole cat se sequence here is awesome. Uh, is. With the punctuation at the end with uh, the cat jumping into the arms of Selena Kyle. It's cool. The cat is almost the same size throughout that. You know, mm -hmm. all six panels. It's another one of those examples of choreography. It's not a superhero fight, but man, it's a lot of motion with these figures. You know, the cat just being your unusual figure. Look at all of these figures and let's talk about motion. There's not one straight up and down character. They all feel like they're, they're you know, they have their own footing. And right here, when you see the bodies kind of moving about in all different ways, like 
fantastic illustration. It's great. That whole page is really strong. Both of those. <laughs> that whole spread is really strong. This whole issue is pretty strong, Ed. <laughs> the, the revelations that un, that get unearthed on Cartoonist Kayfabe. <laughs> so Batman has a little bat whistle that he uh, that he blows. Oh, you know what's funny, man? Like in that right here, uh, thermite in my belt catching. Just because I was an asshole little kid and play discovered anarchist cookbook type shit, like like this is wrong and. This is where I could wax my scientific knowledge because we played with thermite a bunch when we were a kid. You can make it real easy. And uh, the thing about it is that it's very hard to combust. It's, it's hard to catch on fire. You need a magnesium strip. You have to, you have to light it with 3,000 degrees. And wood <laughs> does not burn that hot. Like, you can't hold a lighter up to thermite and get it to catch. Uh, it, this is a great detail. This is Miller, the writer, writing really well. Mm -hmm. Like, not only is Batman cornered in a building, bullet in his leg, now he's without the utility belt. Yes. This is what you, this, as a reader, it's so heightened. They talk he's about... facing, those long odds. Yeah, they, they talk about you got to up your stakes. Up your stakes, up your stakes, up your stakes. And the mark of the writer is, now you have to, you have to write yourself into the corner, and you have to figure out how the hell to get out of there. And you can't go with your first answer either, because the first one's the obvious one. There is a, a tremendous amount of, of perfect structuring in this story if you think of three-act structure. Mm -hmm. So we, this is the end of Act 2 is essentially where we're getting, or, or the second half of Act 2 in this issue, in this building scene. I mean, from a writing standpoint, if you're a three-act structure person, you could study this, this story for that reason. Yeah, the, bat, <laughs> the bats are really a cool piece, really <laughs> smart. This is one of those great pages of editing where Batman makes his escape on a cop car, one rookie is like still trying to chase him, but through a cluster of bats, the bats lead him off a pier. Everybody who was there in the crowd has to get shots in their asses. So there's Selena and, uh, you know, Bizarro World, Carrie Kelly. And by the way, you can tell it in one panel. Right. We don't have to have medical people hauling them there, waiting in the waiting room. Long explanation about what's going on. One panel. Right. It tells us everything. I like that Batman and the cop are going in opposite directions. It's a very subtle piece of comic storytelling, but guess what? Batman zigged, and the cops zagged. Let's talk about some zigging and zagging in um, marital relations right here on this next page, because the relationship is getting uh, stronger and stronger between the two. Jim Gordon and his uh, detective homegirl. World's greatest dad mug right there to kind of sell, sell the whole thing. Yeah. Maybe not the world's greatest husband. Look at the way that arm is drawn. That's very toth. It's yeah. just one line to, to show that shoulder padded uh, blazer that she's wearing. Her hair is also another one of those minimal things, just a couple of lines, but it has shape, volume, yeah. really good hair. Another one of those great uh, weighted gestures, mm -hmm. man, where you could tell that all her weight's on this leg right there, man. I like her checking her watch. That's a fun move, like the watch is spun around on your wrist. Yeah, the way you, our moms used to check their watches. Now Bruce Wayne's trying to set up an alibi for uh, for bullet holes in his arms and legs. We all had the Charlotte Hornets jackets around this time, man. <laughs> when uh, when Muggsy and Larry Larry, uh, Larry Johnson were on the team, we all had the Charlotte Hornets starter coat. That's funny. <laughs> little Hopper, little Nighthawks gimmick, right yeah, here. Absolutely. You know what? One note on this. I love the snow. You know, that's something that's colored in the in the uh, repainted edition. I like the white space. Whenever Richmond Lewis can use that white space for something, I love it. And Snow's a great use of it. Talk about a, a switching your, uh, your your scenery from the inside of the police office to uh, the Alps. Right. It's, that's a visual, visually very different. You know what's, you know what's interesting that I just sort of picked up looking at it right this minute? You could suppose that it's it's these guys like one of these guys might be the one to snap the photo or something. Yeah, very very possible. You know, like this is the photo, so it's basically the same geography. And you know, this is the part where Jim Gordon, good call, steps out on his old lady. <clears throat> I hate to keep throwing these up here, but this whole page to me, I just love the original coloring compared to the muted secondary. I mean, even the yellows. You know, you go from Selena to Gordon. Visually, it's a very clear indicator that we're switching scenes, switching characters, and I just love that concentrated magenta. We're going to have to do it one more time because this is a big one. <laughs> this is a big one. I've, when I had this, got this trade, I'd never seen anything like this. Right. 
I don't think I've seen anything like it since. Maybe Lynn <laughs> Varley does some interesting stuff with uh, sure, with uh, some or um, Bill Sienkiewicz with uh, the on the Daredevil graphic novel. Miller does some interesting stuff like this, but she's just going ham. Yeah, I think the Daredevil is a good reference because Miller links everything. So I'm sure Mazzucchelli and Sienkiewicz are looking at each other's stuff, talking shop, talking through Miller. Miller's probably showing each of those guys whatever the other one's doing, um, and it does feel like the Daredevil Love and War graphic novel has some of that kind of patterns uh, used in it. And once again, man, like like when you see stuff like this, you can almost like smell that room and don't smell good. And also, Barbara for sitting there barefoot, pregnant, man, she could develop some some taste levels when it comes to a bed, bed uh, upholstery. I thought you were going to say something different, which is we talk about him being able to draw kids and old people and big and little people and now pregnant people that look pregnant. No, it's a beautiful drawing, but I just can't get past the fact yes. that Barbara Gordon would choose such a gaudy, <laughs> disgusting looking sheets that your grandma would get. Our letter's not in this one, is it? Last issue? All right, man. This is good stuff too, man. He's out to clean up a city that likes being dirty. He can't do it alone harkens back to some of the early uh cover work by probably like jerry robinson very iconic kind of batman stuff the spotlight in the alley yep against the brick wall and now you're talking about your uh your nighthawks edward hopper in case there was any doubt you know i don't think we saw the the name on that previous panel but it's very clear now who we're referencing <laughs> i'm feeling the muñoz energy with the, with this face right here the furrowed brow has something to do with it Batman climbing up the the cement like indentations of the bricks. That's pretty fucking sick, man. That's that's some manga type stuff right yeah, there. Yeah, it's real good. Even his fingers curled over as he's like pulling himself up. It's good and it's so simple, you know? Like this can this can make a little kid think like they could make comics or something. Believable office setting. Yeah. Here's a strange difference. That top panel, you'll see, it's it's uh, bordered off, right? Right. The, the, clearly, the filing cabinets, you can see where they're cut off. Full bleed on the uh, on the redo. Good eye. Yeah, I hadn't noticed it before, but, you know, like I said, you see the top of those cabinets. Something, maybe we can't do full bleed on newsprint at the, at the time here. It's possible. Yeah, it's possible. You take all that for granted now, but <laughs> it, it had to start at some point, and maybe it wasn't yet. To me, this is an iconic panel. Yeah, it's real fun. <clears throat> it's real fun, and it's also part of the lineage of Batman. You know, like when I think of 60s Batman TV show, it's climbing up the building, so got to have some version of it. Yeah. This is awesome. So, like, the previous page, this, like, drug this drug dealer guy who, who uh, you know, it's his fourth time going into the clink, and he gets bail, uh, no problem. Jim Gordon goes to Harvey Dent. Like, how, why did you, how did you let him get bail? He did all this damage. He got arrested four times. He's not a good guy. And then Harvey Dent is trying to, you know, stave off uh, Jim Gordon. Uh, but we realize it's only to uh, allow Batman to get you, his hands on him. You know how people say, like, um, like, like uh, police and criminals or corruption? It, it's sort of the same on, on all these sides. Like, corruption's corruption. Mm-hmm. Batman is is building the same network that the corrupt cops had. He's in with the district, the assistant district attorney. He's in with this uh, rising police star and Jim Gordon as this issue unfolds. He's building that same kind of network that the that the corrupt police and mayor and commissioner had in place. He's doing his own version, but it's the same kind of thing. Sure. Yeah, well said. All of these settings are so great, man. Like he really set dresses mm -hmm. every room perfect to what you would imagine the the character would would have you know yeah, this is so decadent yeah and, and you know this is scarface type stuff all that's this, this is a tiger. Frisetta sculpture in the background right like oh that, that's a that, that, drawing for sure yeah that, yeah, that that's figure with the woman first, first cover it is it is feet yeah it's really fun to see that that's one of those lessons like as an aspiring car or as a working cartoonist you you can learn from this part yeah you know make those right make, make those settings uh special And then the, the final page, like, the dude just goes, turns himself back right. in. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the whole idea is that he's going to spill the beans on that lieutenant, uh, I mean, that detective Flask guy. Yeah, who's who's very connected. You know, you just keep flipping people up, right? Isn't that... Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gordon goes around the commissioner, that's what we're hearing about here, uh, you know, in arresting Flass and giving him to internal affairs. So it sets Loeb and his big 
time friends up really against Gordon. Like shit is coming to a head and there is panic now from the upper the upper levels of this corruption. Throughout this throughout this comic, Gordon is trying to figure out who the F is Batman and he is he's fully on point, you know, like at first the idea was maybe it's this Harvey Dent guy. You know, he's not able to put enough of these guys behind bars. He's going to take things into his own hands. But who can afford the tchotchkes? Who can afford all these little batarangs, man? Uh, 3D printers don't exist then. So the logical place to go is uh, Wayne Manor. Because that kid, you know, he, if, he has some kind of motivation. His parents got killed a couple years back. So this is uh, Bruce Wayne acting like uh, Dan Bilzerian, one of those, like, young multi-zillionaire dynastic wealth you know male paris hilton type dudes he's a pig ed <laughs> yeah whatever you call that <laughs> got this pink-haired girl with a man and they're, and they're drinking at noon and here's that moment i mentioned you know secrets they're talking about bruce wayne and his secrets and then he has to come clean with his wife yeah like the the commissioner a little bit earlier is like you need to you better fall in line man you better do things you better quit Rustling feathers, uh, you know, shows a picture of Jim Gordon kissing that lady that is not his wife. So right here, he's just going to spill the beans, man. He's going to let her know. He's got to, this is the David Letterman conversation, man. Yeah. And then knowing that that uh, was going to come down the pike at some point, because he's still going to stay the course, the wife has to address it. None too happy. Hey, man, look at this. You know, mentioning how there's generations of these artists that follow the Fran Francisco Francovella, the Life After Archie. And again, I'm a fan of his, but this is even a color palette that you'll see him use. Yeah, and, for sure. Uh, and more power to him. It looks great. And I don't see David Mazzucchelli drawing comics now, so I'm happy to see it. Right. But, uh, you know, you really do see this. If you start, Chris Samney, I think, is a guy who's, who's taken uh, some, some influence from this work. It's great, man. It's police drama and stuff. Like the witnesses, they try to kill that witness, and then uh, Catwoman robs the uh, robs the commissioner Loeb and yeah. gets all this pop culture icon stuff, which is that weird. It's an ongoing piece of Commissioner Loeb, but it's strange characterization. But nevertheless, they still still forty thousand dollars worth of pop culture <laughs> <laughs> stuff. Thought he'd have jewels or paintings, <laughs> and they're just this? tearing it apart. And, and you know what? ripping the head off of like the little dolls like what is this junk and you know like like that's that's how it would be man like somebody comes into your spot they're taking the vcr or i guess uh the blu-ray player <laughs> yeah, your, really your, your, your laptop they're not they're not taking your new mutants 98 yes yeah exactly <laughs> this is catwoman having her year one yes. you know like she's trying to rob rich people and she's getting stuff that she can't do anything with it's, yeah it's similar to batman not inspiring fear in the criminal's heart the first couple of times out jimmy this panel yeah it's it's that's a quality panel incredible and so, you see the dumb line on display there you know look at it, the way his his arm is drawn the legs it's just a line yeah the the anatomy is in there but he doesn't have to show every piece of sinew to you if, if it feels like the adam west costume except without the po the little pooch look how great whenever it goes from this to landing yeah on the same page yeah very cool so this is the the roman is that his name he's like the top i guess criminal guy there yeah he's and, a dude uh, that got uh, tied up butt naked before right so everything has built a head now he has his nephew who's apparently a, a pretty good hitman in town to do a job and Catwoman's up in her game and kind of throwing uh, throwing problems into Batman's plan. Yeah, this is always a good uh, spread. Got that little piece of Batman up there. Yeah. After he throws his gimmicks. This is one of the pieces that I always puzzled over. Like, what am I looking at there? Like, when I was a little dude, I was like, this, this, I love this art. This one confuses me. It's a very interesting mask. You know, I'm figuring out how to draw the mask from the different angles because it, it's, it, you can see what it is. Yeah. You know, in that previous panel, you get a good look at kind of like the diagram of what this mask is. And then this is an artist that understands, look, if you shift it to this angle, this is what it looks like. Yeah. And, and Bruce Banner doing one-handed push-ups makes me mad. Anybody doing one-handed push-ups? <laughs> <laughs> One more callback to Commissioner Loeb's pop culture infatuation and there is where you can see his disgusting hand yeah even this image right here it makes me think of like uh, in dame to kill for that little guy at the beginning that solicits the photographs from dwight yeah 
yeah, I didn't read the script that's in the back of this book, but you got to wonder, like, early on if he's described as pock-faced, and, you know, I'm sure Miller's laying that in there. <laughs> Another good car sequence is, is bikes and cars are going back and forth and chase scenes are ensuing. Yeah, we got Bruce Wayne. He didn't have time to get in a costume. Well, it's daytime, Ed. Oh, yeah, he, right, you right. You don't wear the costume during the day. <laughs> right. This is great in that everybody kind of figures out what's happening at the same time. Bruce Wayne realizes, like, if you're going after Gordon, what do you do here? Mm -hmm. And it's going to be kidnapping, blackmail, that kind of thing are the options. And, of course, it's kidnapping. Yes. Yeah. Wow. The bad guys get hold of the wife and the baby. This is some tough Jim Gordon shit where he's like, if they leave, they're dead. And so he goes for it. You know, he shoots, he shoots his wife free by shooting the guys around her, and she's smart in how she handles it, but doesn't get to the baby. <laughs> catches Bruce Bruce Wayne in the chest. Yeah. Takes the bike. That's a good shot of him bearing down on him on the bike, no helmet. And then this is a Jack good shot too. Or he's, him. he's just gonna hop on a Schwinn and try to catch these dudes who have some horsepower behind them. I always love the bike designs, like the pedal bike designs, because they're the equivalent of a stick person. But they're super well designed and you can bend them, you know, at different angles. So cool. And uh, you know, looks perfect. <laughs> but yeah. That's uh, taking it to the next level after taking a shot, a slug in the in the ribs. Even if you had your armor on, that's not going to feel too good. I agree, man. Uh, the freaking architecture drawing of this bridge is perfect. It mm -hmm. doesn't look like one line is mismeasured or anything. Another good car accident. Gordon running, good running shot, especially running at the camera, very hard to draw. Yeah, and... I just love like little stuff like this. Always got to be mindful of just mm -hmm. adding a little bit more depth by putting some smoke in front, or you know, put something in front there to kind of sell, sell some depth on this two D surface that we're trying to create some illusions with. Some uh, some more silhouette toward the force stuff. <laughs> Jeez, man, he he's just so good. At, they don't even feel like tricks, right? And yeah, maskless uh, Bruce Wayne hands the baby off, and Jim Gordon's like, you know, I'm practically blind. I can't see a thing. Now, Jimmy, I'm practically blind for real. Like without these glasses, I could see you. I could <laughs> tell who you are. And here we are, man. It's our final month in uh, year one. Yeah, everything has kind of worked out. They kept their star witness on the stands. It's going to certainly change the political dynamics in Gotham City as a result. And uh, and you're starting to see it. Gordon gets his promotion, and now he's uh, he's got a, he's formed a bit of an alliance with Batman here at the end. The friendship has been established. The uh, the, the the trust. There's some guy who calls himself the Joker, but I got a friend coming, and he's lit up right there. Implications of like a bat signal kind of gimmick. Yeah. How much is this Sin City? Yeah, I mean that's that is that is a panel right out of Sin City. Love the snow too. I we've looked at enough comics where you see a lot of snow, a lot of cartoonists. That's a thing that ends up finding its way into comics. It's a cool visual. This is a nice snow. It's very organic. Yeah, all up to Richmond. I don't think that Mazzucchelli has anything to do with that. There's nothing in the line to indicate it. There's no white cut out into the silhouettes or anything. I think you're right because the snow pattern is just slightly different on the uh, on the colored version. Not not a lot to draw from that, but if you do really close analysis, you can see that it's it's close, but it's different, uh, which would indicate it's not an overlay or something that Mazzucchelli created, but rather yeah. something Richmond Lewis puts in there. Heck of a comic, Jimmy. It is, and we have one more little uh, nice piece. In this archive, or in the Absolute Edition, they reprint the letters columns that, that would follow like several issues later, but for each issue, and our very first, well, not our first, the, the, the page turn letter here, this is Alex Toth, writing in. Alex Toth writing in. Somebody had drawn his attention to Batman Year One, and uh, he liked what he saw and took time to write this note. Toth, you know, known for being crotchety and, and, and uh, critical, uh, goes goes out of his way. He writes a letter and sends it to a Batman comic to say how impressed he is with, with Mazzucchelli. And uh, a happy blend of Pratt, Munoz, Hernandez, Battaglia, and Thorne's work of 20 years ago. Frank Thorne work. <laughs> Not current Frank Thorne work. Um, but Hernandez being name dropped in there. I mentioned H Jose Munoz earlier, um, Hugo Pratt, who at some point we really need to get under the camera. But uh, 
you know, I feel like there's a lot of Frank Miller, Frank Miller taking notes on all these guys, although I think he was already on board with all these guys. But how cool is it to get a note from Alex Toth? Not only is it cool as fuck, but Bataglia? I got a new name to track down because I don't know any Bataglia. Hey, I'll, I'll be honest, me either. Yeah. I'm sure we'll get some notes in the comments for that. Tell us what to look for. Absolutely. Tell us the Bataglia that we should go find. Absolutely. But man, I, I just think that's a cool piece. And again, like, this is how well put together these absolute editions are. They have the letters page for each issue. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, they note where it ran and stuff that's super cool. And this is fun because we've looked at letter pages. We looked at the letter page for, uh, for the G.I. Joe silent issue. And uh, these are cool because Denny O'Neill talks about mostly it's positive, but there are people who hate it. And a couple of these letters are very critical. They are. <laughs> and uh, it's funny to think about that now, but... It happens. It, it is, but it's also no surprise. Like, you know, we're on YouTube right now. Everybody's watching this thing on YouTube. Uh, type in, I don't know, cute kid dancing and click on that video and see how many thumbs downs are for that video. Right. Each one of those people is a douchebag piece of shit. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's shocking. Like this letter, you know, you follow Alex Toth praising the art. I don't know if there could be a higher compliment. And then you get uh, John Craddock writing in and being like, that's not a not complaining about all of this stuff. The only part he likes is that the yellow circle around the bat symbol is off the costume, but that's not enough, especially when it's surrounded with terrible art. <laughs> so once more, I scream out, no more hacks. <laughs> no more hacks. David Mazzucchelli is as far as you can get from a hack for somebody that works in comics. Incredible, though. But, I mean, that's, that's what it is. You're right. That's no exactly surprise what it is. whatsoever, man. Like, you you get enough of a circle. It's just uh, it's a numbers game. You get good circulation. You get more schmuckery. You get more uh, more Mark talk. That's Mark talk, you know? I'll, I'll give you some Mark talk uh, from my brain. Yeah. One thing I learned in this letters, in reading these letter columns is uh, Chris Warner had a run on Batman. He did, yeah. And I didn't. I have never seen a, a Chris Warner Batman, so that's something that's on my list now to, uh, to, to look up. That, that early run, like around this time, like Chris Warner was in there, uh, Karen Dwyer, who's an artist mm -hmm. I dig a lot, I makes, like makes his debut, introducing Karen Dwyer, you know? Karen Dwyer's art, I think you could see some similarities with, with Mazzucchelli. Uh, at, different, at least at different points in their career, I think there's some, some crossover stylistically, so that's, that's an interesting one. Yeah. And once again, just to just to seal the mantle of uh, absolute Batman Year One as being like one of the great, the crown jewels of packaging. Yeah. Uh, this is the you know this is the version to have. Look at it's the complete script, bunch of thumbnails. You also see pencils from uh, some pages. You could really uh, teach a class on comics just with this volume. Thousand percent. Thousand percent, man. I feel inspired. How about you, Jimmy? Yeah, it was fun to go through this one. It's uh, it's always th this is you know we reread this stuff. Sometimes we read stuff for the first time. This is a series or a, a book that I've read over and over throughout my life, probably since I was thirteen or fourteen. Uh, rereading it, I still find so much new stuff. For sure, for sure, and it was cool. Like now having the channel uh, is awesome because now I have to read it with like a different kind of mindset a little bit. I have to try to articulate some of the virtues that I get out of the, the, the project and verbalize the stuff. So that's like an extra level of consideration that I give whenever we take a look at this crap, man. But listen, last thought on Mazzucchelli, uh, at least for now, it looks, his art works really well with this 64 color traditional palette. Mm -hmm. Also works really well with full color painted art. And I think that his art style is something that really transitions into the contemporary where you can do flat color, you can do digital color, you can do painting on it. And I think that's part of the reason so many artists have been influenced by him because I think that number is growing. I see more artists today that are influenced by him than you know immediately following this or any time in between. And, uh, and I think that really speaks to what he brings with that dumb line is let the colorist define some of these things. Makes sense. Makes sense, man. That's a good place to leave it. K Fabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. Patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. I just posted my mini comic Rambo 3.5. Uh, lots of other comics, mini comics, and zines are available on there. Lots of artwork, notes, uh, process stuff. So Patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. At the link below, at my link tree, pre-order Red Room issue number one. Going to be on the stands in May, but you can get your pre-orders in right now. My stuff always uh, goes out of print really, really fast. So if you secure yours now, you're going to be able to get that first printing. Uh, if you uh, want to read the issues, 
hit uh, the Patreon, patreon.com slash I serialize new pages every Tuesday, and as of this recording, there are two issues up there as we speak. What else? You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video to keep up with everything we have going on. And as you can already tell, 2021 is a busy year for Cartoonist Kayfabe. Yeah, what you working on? <laughs> you can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. Jimmy, one more set of merchandise. Let's be on our way, man. Read more comics.